Nathaniel Prentice Banks was an American politician and a Union general during the American Civil War. A mill worker by background, Banks was prominent in local debating societies, and his oratorical skills were noted by the Democratic Party. But his abolitionist views fitted him better for the nascent Republican Party through which he became Speaker of the United States House of Representatives and Governor of Massachusetts. At the outbreak of the war, President Lincoln appointed Banks as one of the first political major generals over the heads of West Point regulars, who initially resented him, but came to acknowledge his influence on the administration of the war. After suffering an inglorious defeat in the Shenandoah at the hands of the newly famous Stonewall Jackson, Banks replaced Benjamin Butler at New Orleans as commander of the Department of the Gulf, charged with liberating the Mississippi. But he failed to reinforce Grant at Vicksburg, and only took the surrender of Port Hudson after Vicksburg had fallen. He was then put in charge of the Red River Campaign, a doomed attempt to occupy eastern Texas. Banks had no faith in this strategy, but the outgoing general-in-chief, Henry Halleck, is believed to have told Grant that it was Banks' idea, in order to dodge responsibility for this expensive failure, for which Banks was removed from command. After the war, Banks returned to the Massachusetts political scene, where he influenced the Alaska Purchase legislation and supported women's suffrage. Early life Nathaniel Startle Prentice Banks was born at Waltham, Massachusetts, the first child of Nathaniel P. Banks, Sr., and Rebecca Greenwood Banks, on January 30, 1816. His father worked in the textile mill of the Boston Manufacturing Company, eventually becoming a foreman. Banks went to local schools until the age of 14, at which point the family's financial demands compelled him to take a job in the mill. He was a bobbin boy, responsible for replacing bobbins full of thread with empty ones. Because of this he became known as Bobbin Boy Banks, a nickname he carried throughout his life. He was eventually apprenticed as a mechanic alongside Elias Howe. Recognizing the value of education, he continued to read, sometimes walking to Boston on his days off to visit the Athenaeum Library. He attended company-sponsored lectures by luminaries of the day including Daniel Webster and other orators. He formed a debate club with other mill workers to improve their oratorical skills, and took up acting. He became involved in the local temperance movement, speaking at its events brought to him to the attention of Democratic Party leaders, who asked him to speak at campaign events during the 1840 elections. He honed his oratorical and political skills by emulating Robert Rantoul, Jr., a Democratic congressman who also had humble beginnings. His success as a speaker convinced him to quit the mill. He first worked as an editor for two short-lived political newspapers. After they failed he ran for a seat in the state legislature in 1844, but lost. He then applied to Rantoul, who had been appointed collector of the Port of Boston, for a job. The job gave him sufficient security that he was able to marry Mary Theodosia Palmer, an ex-factory employee he had been courting for some time. Banks ran unsuccessfully for the state legislature in 1847, antebellum political career. In 1848 Banks was victorious in a second run for the state legislature, successfully organizing elements in Waltham whose votes were not easily controlled by the Whig-controlled Boston Manufacturing Company. He was at first moderate on the expansion of slavery, but recognizing the potency of the burgeoning abolitionist movement, he became more strongly attached to that cause. This brought Banks, along with fellow Democrats Rantoul and George S. Boutwell to form a coalition with the Free Soil Party that successfully gained control of the legislature and governor's chair. The deals negotiated after the coalition win in the 1850 election put Boutwell in the governor's chair and made Banks the Speaker of the Massachusetts House of Representatives. Although Banks did not like the radical Free Soiler Charles Sumner, he supported the coalition agreement that resulted in Sumner's election to the United States Senate. 
His role as House Speaker and his effectiveness in conducting business raised his status significantly, as did his side work for the State Board of Education, Congress. In 1852 Banks sought the Democratic nomination for a seat in the United States Congress. While it was at first granted, his refusal to disavow abolitionist positions meant party support was withdrawn. He ended up winning a narrow victory with free soil support. In 1853 he presided over the State Constitutional Convention of 1853. This convention produced a series of proposals for constitutional reform, including a new constitution, all of which were rejected by voters. The failure, which was led by Whigs and conservative anti-abolitionist Democrats, spelled the end of the Democratic Free Soil Coalition. In Congress Banks sat on the Committee of Military Affairs. He bucked the Democratic Party line by voting against the Kansas-Nebraska Act, which overturned the 1820 Missouri Compromise. Supported by his constituents, he then publicly endorsed the abolitionist cause. In 1854 he formally joined the Know Nothing cause, was re-nominated for Congress by the Democrats and Free Soilers, and won an easy victory in the Know Nothing landslide. In 1855 Banks agreed to chair the convention of a new Republican Party convention, whose platform was intended to bring together anti-slavery interests from the Democrats, Whigs, Free Soilers, and Know Nothings. When Know Nothing Governor Henry Gardner refused to join in the fusion, Banks carefully kept his options open, passively supporting the Republican effort but also avoiding criticism of Gardner in his speeches. Gardner was re-elected. At the opening of the 34th Congress in December 1855, men from several parties opposed to slavery's spread gradually united in supporting Banks for Speaker. After the longest and one of the most bitter speakership contests on record, lasting from December 3, 1855 to February 2, 1856, Banks was chosen on the 133rd ballot. This has been called the first national victory of the Republican Party. He gave anti-slavery men important posts in Congress for the first time, and cooperated with investigations of both the Kansas conflict and the caning of Senator Charles Sumner. Because of his fairness in dealing with the numerous factions, as well his parliamentary ability, Banks was lauded by others in the body, including former Speaker Howell Cobb, who called him, in all respects, the best presiding officer I had ever seen. Banks played a key role in 1856 in bringing forward John C. Fremont as a moderate Republican presidential nominee. Because of his success as Speaker, Banks was considered a possible presidential contender, and his name was put in nomination by supporters at the Know Nothing Convention, held one week before the Republicans met. Banks then refused the Know Nothing nomination, which went instead to former President Millard Fillmore. Banks was active on the stump in support of Fremont, who lost the election to James Buchanan. Banks easily won re-election to his own seat. Democrats, however, regained control of the House of Representatives, depriving him of the speakership. Governor of Massachusetts in 1857 Banks ran for governor of Massachusetts against the incumbent Henry Gardner. His nomination by the Republicans was contentious, with opposition coming primarily from radical anti-slavery interests opposed to his comparatively moderate stand on the issue. After a contentious campaign Banks won a comfortable victory. Banks' tenure in office coincided with a period of government contraction forced by the depression of those years. He made a serious attempt to gain the Republican presidential nomination in 1860, but discord within his party in Massachusetts, a residence in a safe Republican state, and his know-nothing past doomed his chances. He then was briefly resident director in Chicago, Illinois, of the Illinois Central Railroad, hired primarily to promote the sale of the railroad's extensive lands.